Kip, what's going on, man? I like the new backdrop that you've got going on today. Uh, you look you look very professional today. Uh, that's what uh, I have to dress up like a monkey at work sometimes. A what's monkey. cool, it's too bad that there's overcast. Otherwise, those you'd be able to see the Wasatch Mountains behind me, but it's all covered in clouds so. if you didn't have the uh if you didn't have the inversion if there wasn't clouds there'd be the inversion right that's true that's true we we need to do this <laughs> right after a storm so it's clear skies for half a day clear it all out so it looks great back there <laughs> well if you looked out my window you would see a pretty good snowstorm actually what i would consider our first like real snow of the winter here in maine and there is quite a bit of snow out there today it's uh it's interesting so, what is cool. what is what does that consist of? Is it I mean, is it going to drop a, a couple feet or like how? Yeah, it, there was supposed yeah. to be. Uh, I heard over the over the course of 24, 36 hours, whatever it is, day and a half or so, um, 14 inches, I think, on this storm itself. So I don't know if that's a lot or a little. It's a lot for me because the most we ever got in southern Utah was like a half inch of snow and it didn't even stick on ground. Yeah. Yeah, so just we'll, melted. We'll see. Yeah. Very cool. Well, good. Well, let's get into some questions today. I know we've got a ton from our exclusive brotherhood, the Iron Council, which, by the way, man, the Iron Council has really, really been growing over the past several weeks. We can talk a little bit about that. And then questions. I don't even know or think that we'll get to the questions from the Facebook group on this podcast, uh, but we'll get to that on a future podcast and try to get as many as we can answered. Yeah. Well, we'll do our best, guys. It's all, it's all one can do. Do their yeah. best. Is do this the best. second Ask Me Anything of the of the year? Yes, it's the second one of the year because the last week's was on the first, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, well let's get into them. What questions we got today? Yeah, thank all right. you. You too. Yeah. Robert Thompson, what exactly is ego and how can one learn to identify their own? Also, is ego good, bad, or both? I do like this different approach to this. I mean, we've answered this question obviously before, but <clears throat> learning to identify your ego is kind of a little bit different twist on this, and I kind of like it. I do too. Uh, well, ego, simply put, is an overinflated sense of uh, competency, I would say. Uh, now, is it? I'm going to skip the middle question for a second. Is it bad or good or both? It, it's a tool. That's all. It's a tool. I used to think that ego was all negative, that if you had any sort of ego or arrogance about you, that it was all negative and it's uh, a virtue. Well, not a virtue, a characteristic that should be repulsive to you. I actually don't believe that anymore. I think that you need to have some level of ego in your life in order to thrive and excel. Because if you didn't have an over, somewhat overinflated sense of competency, you wouldn't do anything because it would just be too risky. So yeah. ego is what allows us to try new things, to think that maybe we could be somewhat capable at trying something we've never done before. Because what, for example, when I started the podcast, what would give me the right to believe that I could do this thing called podcasting? I'd never done it before. When I started jujitsu, what in my right mind would ever make me think or believe that I could be somewhat decent at it over the course of a little, a little time. I, I wouldn't. So ego is needed. You need to have an over in, uh, inflated sense of, of competence, competency or capability. Otherwise you just wouldn't do anything. So yeah. it's a powerful tool. Now you can let it get out of hand for sure. And this is how you begin to identify to, to Robert's second question as to whether or not it's getting out of hand. Is it serving you? That's it. Is it serving you? Is your overinflated sense of competency or capability pushing you to try new things, to take calculated risks, to be assertive, to be bold, to do something you've never done before, and that's a good thing? Or is it closing you off to feedback? Is it keeping you from trying new things because you don't want to damage your sense of worth or reputation? These are indicators that your ego is no longer serving you and that maybe it's getting out of hand and creating a problem for yourself. It's like it's, it's it, ego to me is like any other tool, whether it's a hammer or a screwdriver or a drill in the proper context. It's a beautiful thing in the improper context. You can create some real damage with some of those tools if you don't use them correctly. Cool. There you go. 
talking about improper tools. Do you see, not to bring up news, but do you see that, um, hear about that shooting in Texas at that church? Oh my goodness, man. That was, well, first let me say this. It was tragic because two men in the, in the congregation died, but that shot that that security officer made was unbelievable. I mean, not only was he obviously caring, but he was well-trained. Yeah. I mean, he flinched because that's just human reaction to nature. Drew his, drew his firearm, engaged, took one shot, shot that guy right in the head, dropped him, and then continued to advance to, to neutralize the threat, which had already been neutralized by that point. But holy cow, that was very, very impressive. And I commend him. And there was like seven other people who, if you looked at that video, all drew their firearms and <laughs> yeah. went over to react as well. I'm like, this guy picked the wrong church to mess with. <laughs> Totally. Like multiple people approached with handguns. And what was impressive, and I don't know, I mean, from the video, and I think I, I don't know if it's accurate or not, this is just regurgitated information, but he was roughly, I think, 25 to 30 feet is what I heard, which anybody that's ever shot a handgun, being accurate at 15 feet is, is tough. Accurate yeah. at 30, holy cow crap like that is pretty impressive especially due to the situation and i'm sure his ad adrenaline is pumping and everything it was well and the target was, quite was moving like yeah was, and people were running around shot. i mean it was yeah it was really impressive yeah and and i think it's good i think that's one less evil individual in the world and one more wake-up call to those would-be terrorists who might think twice about doing what that guy did because of the consequences that they may face. That's why everybody needs to carry or have the right to carry. Yeah. All right. Chris Burke, what are the best ways to open up to other men? I've been on one heck of an introvert for the past decade and I have lost any, uh, semblance, semblance. I don't even know that word. Chris semblance, semblance, semblance of a brand, a band of brothers in my life. I've started playing rugby again with a great group of guys, but I'm finding it difficult to develop those relationships. Yeah, because guys don't connect like that, right? So if you're talking about opening up to individuals, to men specifically, it's going to come across probably as weird or awkward. A lot of guys aren't familiar with it or comfortable with it, but there are some that are. So I think you're doing it right. You're talking about rugby, uh, I think any sort of activity that involves physicality, that involves competition, that involves uh, a common enemy, in this case, the other team, and you're working towards a common pursuit, which is to win and score, uh, I think that's a really great way for men to bond together, to connect, to to figure out who they like and who, who maybe they don't and who they relate with and who they don't. So just keep doing that. That's a very good thing. And then over time you'll start to develop a deeper bond with some of them over others. And Stephen Mansfield talked about this years ago. I had him on the podcast and we've developed a friendship. He said, you don't want to like bombard men with questions that get them to open up because again, it's like, whoa, 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 this is weird because guys aren't good at this. So you just put feelers out, right? So you can talk about if it's you and I, Kip, and we're, we're training at the same gym. Hey, Kip, you know, I really appreciate it, you know, like getting a roll with you or whatever. Like, um, I just read this new book. It's really cool. Like, are you read? Do you like to read? Yeah, I do like to read. Oh, cool. What are some of your favorite books right now? I know what you're interested in, right? Um, I would also invite you over into a, into a group setting. So it's not again, awkward, right? Yeah. Cause if I'm like, Hey dude, you want to go hang out? It's like, do you want to grab coffee like, and talk? This yeah. is like a date, right? <laughs> so instead put together a fight night. Right. Yeah. So now you have a couple of guys. Hey, I got fight night pay-per-views on. Um, we've got three or four guys. Hey, Kip, you know, I don't I don't know what you have going on on Saturday night, but I've got like three or four guys coming over. We're just doing fight night. If you want to come over, bring some drinks and some chips or whatever, like come over and hang out with us. This is a good way to get these guys involved and interconnected with each other. And then again, putting those feelers out about uh, books like let's say you've read a, a common book. Ask, hey, what did you think about that? What, what did you like about that? Or what did you implement in your life? and you do this gradually over time, then you start to develop deeper friendships and bonds with people. And eventually at some point you'll get to the place where you can say, Hey man, you know what? Like, I know we haven't really talked 
that much. You, you came over for fight nights. We read some of the same books. I wanted to ask you a question. Like I've noticed that uh, your business seems to do, be doing very well, and I'm kind of struggling with my business. Do you have any pointers? Now you appeal to going back to maybe ego, but certainly their their pride a little bit as you go to that pride and you, and, and you ask that person for advice. Kip, you're going to feel good about that, right? And yeah. you're certainly going to open up about that. So it's a way to be um, – to express some things that you might need to be dealing with or, or fix or work on and also play into that person's desire to, to lead and to serve and to help. And I think you just do this gradually over time, introducing these little conversations and questions. Yeah. The only thing I would add is sometimes you have to establish relationships with these guys and it may take some while. And, and that, and when I say established relationships, that's playing rugby. That's rolling yeah. with guys. Like if I went to, to my gym and I just started training and after a week after training and sparring, I started like opening up in questions, it would be awkward. Why? Because the guys don't know me yet. There's and no you haven't trust. earned that right. Exactly. There's no trust established. We don't know where we stand with each other. We don't know each other. They don't respect you. You don't respect them. But I do that now with anybody that I train with. We know each other, ironically, without ever talking. Mm -hmm. we learn what kind of grit each other's have, what kind of perseverance we have. We, we learn these aspects about each other. So now when I go ask a question, there's already respect established. And now we can talk about other things. It's, it's the guy, it's what we do, right? Work shoulder to shoulder and we gain respect with one another through trial. And then those conversations can happen. It just may take some time. Yeah. I've just found that asking for help is the best way to do it because you're going to find out pretty quickly if you ask for help, if this person is somebody who's, who's cool, frankly, yeah. if he's a dick or an asshole, it's like, all right, cool. Yeah. Next, you know, but if, but if I say like I was at jujitsu, for example, last night and, um, uh, one of the guys I was rolling with Jeremy, he, he had, a, he used a sweep on me and we just kept rolling through it and everything else. And he got me with that same sweep two or three times. And at the end of the, the, the session, I said, Hey, like you kept doing that sweep. What were you doing? And he's like, Oh, let me show you. And he showed me, it was so simple, but I didn't know. So he showed it to me. I'm like, ah, oh, perfect. Thank you. And, and I know Jeremy, but had I not known him, I still would have asked that question and I would have found out really quickly if this is somebody who's interested in at least having some dialogue. So asking a question and asking for help is a great way to put yourself out there and start to identify those who are interested in leading and coaching and having at least conversation, let alone a relationship. Totally. I, I think some of the most in-depth conversations I've ever had is after an hour of open mat laying on the mat, exhausted and sweating. And then someone mm -hmm. goes, so how's things going? No, oh, things are going okay. And then we just start talking about other stuff. Yeah. Um, but it required oh, us that's to a great like point. get after it. Yeah. A great point too, is you have to go first sometimes. Yeah. Right. Because if you're all sitting there after training and you're laying there and everybody's like, Hey, how's it going? You're like, Oh good. Yeah. Things are cool. Like it's been good, busy. Like, you gave yourself no opportunity to open up. But on the other hand, if you say, yeah, man, things are really good. I, you know, my business is actually just kind of struggling right now because uh, we lost like our biggest client last year and it's hard because we're moving into the new year. Oh, okay. Well, now you're opening yourself up to getting some feedback and seeing who's interested. Some guys are going to be like, cool, whatever. <laughs> and that's <laughs> yeah. fine. And other guys are going to be like, oh, you know what? Like I actually went through that same problem two years ago and it was, I hear you, man. It was a real struggle. Oh, okay. Now I just identified somebody who I could potentially build a deeper relationship with. Yeah. Love it. All right. John uh, Domenico, same question as last week. Sorry, John. Apparently you didn't answer your question. I'm between two jujitsu gyms in my area. One excels at building communities. The other structure and tech technique. For someone just getting into it, what is the better option? My goals are to connect with other men, but also learn quality jiu-jitsu. Well, I think you, I think the fact that you asked the, or you answered the second part of that by saying, you know, my, my objective, well, you said my objective is both really. Yeah. So I guess what I would say is, is I'm trying to think about how to answer this, put it on a sliding scale. All right. So you have like camaraderie community on a scale from one to 10. And let's say the one gym is like an eight. And then you have technique 
and 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 structure and maybe they're like a six okay now you have the other gym and their technique and structure is is a nine but their community is like a two then i'm gonna pick the first one yeah because if you want if you want community you want brotherhood you want connection with other men I think the difference between going to a gym that has six with technique versus a nine with technique, but you get the community you're after is going to be a better experience for you. Now I'm saying that as somebody who's new into this world, I don't know if you would agree with that Kip, but I would kind of look at that as a sliding scale and then weighing it and seeing like which one stacks up for what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Though I, I totally agree. The only thing is how do you know, the uh, the one with great technique doesn't excel at community if you're not part of that community quite yet. Uh, and the reason why I say that is I would say the gym that I train at, at first glance, you would assume that we're not a tight kit, tight knit community. But the reality is we're very tight. But for outsiders first coming in, it doesn't feel that way. So we may not be as welcoming and it may take a while. But I would say that community certainly exists and it's really powerful, but I don't think people showing up would see that initially. So I don't know. It's kind of tough. This is a good point. This is something that we run across in, in our church organization. I'm sure you run into this as well. So you have yeah. new people come to church and I've heard people complain like, oh, our ward, like they're not very welcoming. They didn't, they, they didn't befriend us or go out of their way to like welcome us. My yeah. question is, what did you do? Like, what did you do to put yourself in there? Because it's not their job to accept you. Should they? Yeah, probably. Like, they should probably more be more friendly and more open and more inviting. Same thing with the jujitsu gym. Like, it's scary to go into a gym the first time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like, let, it's it's not comfortable. So if you if you own a gym, then please hear me. Like, it's not comfortable. Like, yeah. think back to where when you very first started and try to create an environment that fosters welcoming to new members. Like when new guys come in, I always, I always introduce myself. I go up, I shake their hand. I'm like, Hey, I haven't seen you before. Do you train here? Like, do you train somewhere else? How long you've been training? Cause I know how stupid you feel when you go in there. Yeah, totally. But, but that being said, if you also, as the newbie have a part to play in it and the part that you have to play is it's your requirement and obligation. If you want to go into somebody else's space, whether it's the gym or church or wherever, it's your obligation to assimilate to them, not them to accommodate and assimilate to you. So you have an equal, if not more part to play in putting yourself in the environment, going in and shaking people's hands. It's just as easy for somebody to like me as a newbie to go into a gym and introduce myself to the guy sitting there as it is for him to introduce himself to me. Yeah. So why can't I take a little bit more of an assertive approach and just say, Hey man, like, like, have you been training here for very long? I, this is my first day here. Can you kind of like walk me around a little bit? Like what, what do we need to be doing right now? Again, you appeal to that person's desire to lead and to, to teach and to train, which most guys I feel would be pretty open to that. And, uh, and I think you have a lot more success if you're more assertive about you going into it and feeling like you are the one that has the obligation to assimilate, not the other way around. Totally. Totally. All right. Talking about jujitsu, Clint McKines, uh, he started training actually at, nice. uh, at my gym. Yeah. Oh hey, really? Clint. At your gym? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Sweet. It's funny. Uh, any tips on stepping into a new working environment where you feel everyone else working there is well above your skill level. I'm struggling with moving into a new shop, which is full of amazing guys who I feel like work, uh, who I feel work way above my skill level. I was asked to join them, which makes me feel like they see something good in my work and my work ethics. This is like going from a slightly above average high school sports team to straight to playing pro in my eyes. So I think this is a mindset issue. I actually saw this question before we started and I, and I really like the question, but I think it's a mindset issue. Um, I think what you're looking at is now is how am I going to be, how am I going to fit in? How am I going to make myself known? And all of this is creating some added pressure to your situation when instead the mindset should be good. All these guys are better than me. That means that I'm going to get to level up. Not that I have to but I'm going to have the opportunity to learn and grow 
and 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 pick up new techniques because he's a he's a tattoo artist, correct? Yes. Yeah. So pick up new techniques and learn new to how to use new tools and new strategies. Like this is all a very positive thing. Now it's uncomfortable because you feel like maybe you're not there yet. But what I would do is just take it in stride. Just realize that you are in an environment that's going to help you grow and excel. And maybe it's uncomfortable now, but that means that you are going to grow and excel and push yourself outside of what you're used to. And then just take it in stride. What do I need to learn next? Okay, I need to learn how to work on shading a little bit better, or I need to work on, you know, the, the, this, I don't even know tattooing, but like, like the strokes or the pressure that I use with the needle, like people are like, what the hell is he talking about? I don't have any <laughs> tattoos, guys. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not, I don't even know if I've even been into a tattoo shop or parlor, parlor. or whatever the hell parlor, you call it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but just figure out, okay, what's the next skill set I need to learn? And then ask questions. I'm telling you guys, like if there's a theme in this podcast over the last 20 minutes, just ask questions The more without being annoying, right? And you know, everybody knows, okay, yeah. maybe you're being a little annoying, but, but ask good questions about how to grow, how to expand, how to use a certain technique. People are more than willing to share it. And if they've invited you to the environment, guess what? They want you to come up to their level. They see something in you, unrealized potential. Now they want you to come to the level and they're probably – okay with investing in that in you otherwise they wouldn't have invited you so take it in stride ask good questions have the mindset that this is a very very good opportunity for you yeah and if you're not willing to ask questions then it goes back to robert's initial question where okay ego's playing a part that is negative and right. you need to put your ego in check a little bit w one example of this and i don't know why this came to mind so i'm assuming you're still a 49ers fan is that accurate no no, you're are you not. talking about from well, gift from my gifts from? Well, you mentioned that a couple, like I think it was last week or the week yeah, before. Yeah, I was so eleven. I, was sure I didn't know any better. <laughs> it, regardless, one of <laughs> one of my favorite stories is Steve Young, right? Steve Young, arguably one of the one of the top quarterbacks of all time in the NFL. No doubt, no doubt. And he was underneath or stuck second string. In fact, I think originally he was like fourth string. Behind Joe Montana. Joe Montana. Like, imagine that. Yeah. Now, could have Joe, could Steve immediately go ego? Like, no, I'm going to another team where I'm actually going to get some playing time. But he put his ego in check. He learned everything there was to learn while training with Joe Montana. And and then arguably became the quarterback he he ended up becoming in the NFL. Like that's a prime example of him taking advantage of an opportunity. I'm sure, right? At least the conversations that I've heard uh, him have, he had to put his ego in check that this was like a really multiple times he planned to quit. In fact, if I remember the story correctly, he was actually planning on leaving the 49ers and he was on an airplane sat by some old man and and they were talking and he ended up kind of opening up with him about complaining about never getting playing time. And, and the old guy like spoke to Joe, uh, Steve, Steve Young and said, what a great opportunity you have to train underneath one of the greatest. And that yeah. kind of put him in check and he's like, yeah, what am I complaining about? And then he made his focus on learning from him and becoming better and taking advantage of the opportunity versus complaining that he wasn't getting any playing time. So, yeah, yep. yep. It's a great, uh, 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 about the time that Steve Young started playing first string and started playing, uh, starting for the 49ers, it's about the time I kind of like, I, I don't know if I started chasing girls or got too interested in other things. And so like all of my lock combinations used to be, um, 49, 16, cause 16 <laughs> was, uh, his, his number. Right. And I think, uh, Jerry Rice was 88 maybe. So it was like all my lock combinations were like. 49, 16, 16, 88, 88, 49, like all of my, my garage, my lock combinations. If you ever wanted to steal my bike, just put in some combination <laughs> of Joe Montana's number and 49 and you'd figure out a way to get it. <laughs> Hopefully that's not what you're using for your, your uh, pin number on your bank account or anything. I can neither <laughs> confirm nor deny that. <laughs> all right, Matt Wilson, when you started Order of Man, how did you handle the daily transitions between Order of Man and financial planning? I currently work full time while also having a side business. I work on my business in the early mornings and after my day job. I often find myself thinking too much about my side business while at my day job. Any tips on handling this situation? 
I don't have any tips. Like that's natural, you know, and that's probably a good thing is that you continue to, it's a grind. And, and the fact that you're thinking more about your side job is that's healthy. Like there's nothing actually wrong with that. Um, that just means that it's exciting and engaging to you and you found value in what you're doing. And because you're thinking about it, you're going to implement new strategies and new initiatives that are going to help that eventually take over your, your full-time work. And I was doing the same thing. I would start at, uh, I, it seems like I would start at like five or six in the morning and work for two hours on order of man. And then I would spend a little time with my family, do the breakfast and the scripture study and things like that. Uh, and then I would get ready for work, go in, do my you know day job, which was the financial planning. I'd come home about five thirty, six o'clock, put in a couple hours with the family. Uh, and then I would go back and work for two more hours on order of man stuff. Now for me, in all fairness, I had the luxury of owning my own financial planning firm. So I had a lot of freedom with my schedule and flexibility and it just gradually, the order of man stuff gradually started just consuming more and more of my planning time. I had that luxury. I realize a lot of other people don't have that opportunity. Like they've got a nine to five, they're working for somebody else. They've got to punch in and punch out when they're punched in, they've got to be working and effective for that organization. So I would just make maximum use of my pre work time, my after work time, and then any break time that you have as well. So if it were me, I wouldn't be taking lunch breaks. I'd bring something from home, throw the microwave for 30 seconds, eat it while I was working on order of man stuff. That's what I would do because that's what it requires. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Uh, Chase Carmichael, best strategies for keeping your personal goals, objectives, and tasks paramount with other competing goals and challenges. I see or iron council work, family, faith, Sabbath, when time becomes a limiting factor. Well, they're not competing. Like that's the thing that you have to wrap your head around. They're complementary. Yeah. So yes, you are going to have to take time for workouts, for example. And yes, technically that's time you could be spending with your family, but working out makes you a better husband. It makes you a better father. So they're not competing. They're complementary. So the question is not how do you deal with these conflicting objectives, but how do you coordinate them in a way that's going to produce maximum results? So if you're spending three hours at the gym every day and, and that's coming at the expense of your work or family time, yeah. yeah, something's off. Something's wrong with that probably, right? If you're taking 45 minutes or an hour every day and doing it before the kids are awake because that's the time that you need to do it so you can be engaged with them and then go to work, okay, well, that's healthy. Now you've coordinated them in a way that works and is effective for your grand strategy, which is to become the best version of yourself. So stop looking at it thinking, oh, this competes with this and then this competes with this. No, when you have these healthy goals and objectives, it's not that getting in shape, for example, is only helping you get in shape. No, no it's helping you be a more engaged father, a more engaged husband. You have more energy for work. And your workload is you have a greater capacity for for a, a a bigger workload because you have the more more energy and efficiency. So they're all working together, and all of these little moving parts are just part of the grand scheme of things. And you're not going to make a decision in a vacuum. So if you're trying to improve in in the gym, that's going to have a positive impact on everything else. You're going to sleep better, which means you're going to be more rested for the morning. You're going to have more energy so you can play with the kids and then you're not going to be exhausted at work so you can get actually more done at work with fewer hours. This all works together harmoniously, perfectly. Uh, you just have to make your decisions and make sure when you're weighing where you're spending your time that you're not so heavily weighted in one over the other at the expense of that other thing, right? If I'm going to be training for three hours a day, that's not going to work for me. One hour will work for me, but not three hours because of other things I have to do and get accomplished. Yeah. And I think there's a flip to this where if there's not a balance, then they can affect each other in a negative way. Right. Of course. 
Yes. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're not focused on family and your objective is work, work, work and working out or in yourself and you let that fall to pieces and your family life starts falling apart, guess what? Your work productivity is going to go down and other things are going to go down. So that balance is super important. I've seen this multiple times in the IC where someone's like, oh, I'm doubling down my my objectives this quarter on work because everything's fine at home. Guess what? End of the quarter, things aren't fine at home. No shit, right? Like seriously, right. like the, the balance is super important in to prevent as well as to uh, promote and make things better. Uh, I would add one other thing to Kip is this idea and concept of presence. You have to be very present in the moment. Now, usually when you hear people talk about that, they're talking about it in the context of being with people, right? So if you're with your kids, be present for your kids. Yes, I agree. What I'm talking about is presence in any given moment that you happen to be in. So for example, you and me are doing this podcast right now. I'm not checking my phone. I'm not checking emails. I'm not like texting with my wife about like what's for lunch or what we're doing this afternoon. I'm fully engaged here in this moment. Okay. When I'm at the gym, I'm not dinking around like taking selfies of my ass in the mirror and, and like talking to people. Like that was the one thing when I went into CrossFit, people would always ask me, Oh, are you tired? Like you're not very social. No man, I'm here to work out. Like this is not my social time. Like I'm here to kick ass for the next 45 minutes and then we can talk later. Like tonight when you guys are coming over, remember how you get you and your family are coming over. We'll talk then right now I'm working at work. People say, Hey, do you have time? You want to go out for lunch? And you want, no, I don't want to go out for lunch. I want to stay here and I want to do my work and I want to do it as effectively and efficiently as possible because I'm fully engaged, for example, in emails. Like it's, it's completely possible and probably encouraged to be engaged with even emails like for the next hour. So over the past uh, week or so, I really got behind in my emails because I took the, the time off for family during the holidays and my email was just, it was crazy. Well, yesterday I took an hour and I turned off my alert alerts. I didn't do anything else. Like my kids weren't in here bouncing on me and I wasn't worried about the podcast. I took an hour. I'm like emails, That's all I'm doing emails, super efficient, super effective. Got them cleaned out. Good to go. Now I can move on to the next thing. Yeah. So be very present in the moment because otherwise you're, you're wasting opportunities. You're wasting time. I'll give you a, I'll give you one that's a lot of people do, including myself, is like if you're on your phone in the bathroom, <laughs> like you're spending an extra 20 to 30 minutes while you're doing your business, but you're on your phone, like go in, do your business and get out and get back to your thing. And you just freed up 20 minutes that you would have wasted because you're playing games or checking the socials while you're taking a dump. Like just do your thing, be present with that thing and then go on to your other activities. Yeah, it, it's that whole I mean, there's statistical evidence of this, right? We, there's no such thing as multitasking. It's called jumping between tasks and thought process back and forth, highly ineffective. And, and one thing that I would like to suggest is anyone who's ever presented in a meeting or maintained or managed a team, imagine how much quicker and effective you would be if everyone did not check email checking their laptops, doing other work and playing on their phones during a meeting. You mm -hmm. could have those meetings twice, like half the time. Right. But, or but is the meeting even important? Ask yeah. yourself that, like, should yeah. we even have this meeting? Totally. Yeah. This is something I need to be better at because like, you know, you've even called us out on this in on the leadership call one time. I think <laughs> we, we had a leadership team meeting in the iron council and you're like, Hey, really quick guys. If you're going to be on this call, like I get that there's other conflicting schedules sometimes, but if you can be present, like be a hundred percent present, that is better for you. It's better for us. And, and I remember that and I'm thinking, you know, that's so true. And like, what do I need to do to adjust my schedule? So then that way, when I do have that call with that individual, or I have that meeting that I'm given my full undivided attention so I can give it a hundred percent, whatever it is that I'm doing. And I think if we all did that, our productivity would probably skyrocket. Well, not only that, but your fulfillment as well and your just general sense of worth because you wouldn't have guilt about the way you're performing. So I know, for example, when I'm not fully present with my kids after the fact, oh, I go back yeah. and I review it and I'm like, oh man, I just like, 
my kids wanted to wrestle and I was so worried about emails and then I have all this guilt about it. And then, and then, and then it creates problems, right? The same thing with work. If I'm dinking around and not doing what I should be doing and I'm, I'm working, but I'm not really working, then there's guilt because I didn't get my work done. So if you can be fully present in the moments that you're in, that guilt is just going to go away and you're going to be so much more confident, so much more fulfilled and effective essentially. There's a, there's a thing that I heard, I think it was from Tim Ferriss. He talks about, I think it's Tim Ferriss, the, uh, or maybe it was Cal Newport cause he talks about deep work. Maybe but it was there's me. a lot. It, it was, it was this yeah, guy, was Kip Sorensen. What was I thinking? Of course it was you, <laughs> uh, uh, talking about the, well, since it was you, why don't you go ahead and tell us what it was? <laughs> nah, it's okay. I don't like <laughs> quoting myself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, talking about the time lost in transferring between tasks. So when you transfer from task to task to task to task, it takes you a lot longer to rev out of an, a previous task and up to a new task versus yeah. that's why task stacking and blocking is so valuable. That's why if I take an hour, I can get all my e emails done. If I spread it out over the course of eight to 10 hours, I probably won't get them all done and I won't get a lot of other things done as well. Totally. Yeah. There was a survey actually at Microsoft for developers. It took 15 minutes. So once they were in for deep what? work oh, to oh, okay. reconnect to doing deep work, like programming, if mm -hmm. there was an interruption, it was another 15 minute ramp to get back to where they were. Well, and it's not just 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes because they stopped and they did something else. It's 15 minutes to start back up. So that's 30 minutes. Yeah on one task transfer. Yeah. Think about that over a course of five, six transfers, 10, a dozen transfers per day. That's a lot of wasted time. Totally. It could potentially be three, four, five hours of inefficient work. Now you might still be working, but it's inefficient work. Yeah. That's half your day. More than half your day is inefficient. Yeah. And, and you guys listening that work in offices, how often do you work on a task and you get an email and you go check your email? Right. Right. Or like, somebody comes in and says, Hey Kip, like just quick, quick question. question. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Totally. It's like get headphones. If I have my headphones on, don't bother me. Number two, close your email until you have your scheduled time to check your email. Like there's all, all kinds of good strategies here. Yeah. That I, could quote, about it. that I could quote myself about, but you know, maybe we'll save that for another time. Yeah. Let's save it for like a really important uh, lesson that we want to share at some point. Yeah. Travis para, how do you find a band of brothers in person without going to places like bars and sporting events? Go where they, where, where else they are, you know, they're at the gym, they're, they're playing basketball. They're at the library. They're in your office. They're at the cafe. Like they're everywhere. They're everywhere. I, I, I don't think this is. I don't think this is an issue if you're just a little bit more intentional about where people are. Just yeah. go where people are. And also, here's another strategy. If you're new to an area, and I did a podcast on this, is how to like thrive in a new area. I think it was a couple of months ago. Maybe actually it was when I moved here, which is why I did it. Um. If, if you don't know that many people, just go with the person that you know. Let's say you know one person. Just say, hey, Kip, you know, like I'm new to the area. If, if you happen to be like going out with your buddies or whatever, you mind if I tag along? Like you're not gonna, that's not going to bother you. But again, you have to ask questions. You have to put yourself out there. You have to be assertive. And that's going to feel awkward, awkward and uncomfortable. But you do it anyways because it's important to you. And you want to meet people in a new environment. So look to your office space. Look to existing friendships because they have circles that you don't belong to that you could potentially get involved with. Um, go train, go to the weight room like the, or the, the gym. This is where these people are. Cool. All right, Jake uh, Maddox. Who By the way, hold on. I'm, I'm going to yeah. go back. I've never uh, – let me back up. It's probably been 20 years since I went to a bar. Like, I don't even know if I've ever gone to a bar and I don't go, I go to very, very few sporting events except for my children's. So, and I don't have a problem meeting anybody. Yeah. You just, you got to be intentional about it. Copy. All right. Jake Baddox, who inspired you as a young adult high school years? 
what was it about that person that resonated with you? The one that immediately comes to mind is a gentleman by the name of Matt Labram. He was my high school football coach and baseball coach. In fact, at one point, this was after I'd left high school, he was the head coach for football, baseball, and basketball. So he was very, very involved with the young men and the youth. And the reason that he inspired me so much is because he's somebody that I looked up to as an athlete. He was a great athlete. Uh, and he was very knowledgeable in the skill set and, and sports, but he always held us to task. And that's what I really admired and respected about him. He wasn't so consumed with trying to like win us over or be our buddy. He was worried about being our coach and using the sport of football and baseball in my case as a metaphor for life. So he never took it easy on us. In fact, he was rough with us in a lot of ways, not physically, but rough on us, tough on us is probably the better way to say it because he knew what we were capable of. And he always, it seemed like to me, knew his role in developing and growing us. Now, what was interesting is when I was in high school, he was fairly young. He was fairly new out of college. Hmm. Um, and he was fairly new teacher and new coach. And even we even talk now, fact, he's been on the podcast. Um, he talks a lot about his immaturity in those days when he was coaching us. And you can see it even now, cause I got to speak to his baseball team, uh, earlier this year. Yeah. I think it was earlier this year. He's and still coaching. He's still, still coaching. coaching too. Yeah. <laughs> still coaching. And you could see his level of maturity, but you could also see a lot of the same ways that he engaged. And as I was, as I was talking with his team, I was telling stories as me and another friend, Wayne McIntosh, we were talking about stories from 20 years ago. And the baseball team would laugh because it was the same stories they knew. Yeah. It was the same thing in the same ways that he said it and the same things that he did with them as their coach. So, yeah, he was really inspirational, especially as I didn't have a permanent father figure. I had my stepdad in my life at that point. Um, but, yeah, Matt Labram is somebody that I really admire and respect. And I always have for the past 22 years now, I think is when I met him 22 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah. That's cool. Um, mine would probably be one of my older brothers. So I'm, I'm actually the youngest, um, of nine kids and I, are had, you serious? I didn't know that. Yeah. And I have five older wow. brothers and I did so, not know that about you. Yeah. I'm the baby. Um, yeah, that, but that makes but, sense now. I had an older brother that was just, um, well, I'll, let me just tell this story about him. This kind of sets the precedence. So I, I found this out later and it completely makes sense because this is how he interacted with me. Um, but when he was younger, um, we kind of had a, a father that was disconnected from us. Uh, my parents never got divorced, but I, I didn't live with my father the majority of my life. And um, my brother decided when he was probably in his early teens that he didn't like how that felt and that he was going to use being an older brother to me and the brother just uh, three years older than me, that he was going to use his relationship with the two of us to prepare himself for fatherhood. Hmm. And that was his mindset. And, and so for the remainder of my life growing up, he was, kind of the equivalent of what I always thought a father would be like. He was tough on me sometimes. He encouraged me to work out. He helped me, you know, think of business idea. Like he was constantly coaching me as an older brother. And he really, and he did that from the perspective of, Hey, I want to make sure I'm a, a good dad when I get older. And so I'm going to use Kip as a Guinea pig to help me figure it out. Right. And I, and I was That's his awesome. test project. And so Obviously, I have huge respect for him and how he kind of showed up and, and the role that he didn't have to play in my life, but he chose to. And it benefited him. And I think it obviously benefited me as well. So how much older is he than you? He is roughly <clears throat> 10 years older than I am. OK, so, yeah. So you were, what, six, seven years old then? Is that what you're saying when he kind of took over that role? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's he's always he's always I've always felt 
like he was in that role and probably until, I don't know, maybe the last 10 years. I've always, right. it, he's always kind of been that role for me. So, and That's he was really never, cool. and it wasn't like it was buddy, but it was hold me accountable and responsible at the same time. Does it make yeah. sense? He, he did a great totally. job. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. I think, well, I think there's some commonalities in our story in that, especially you're talking about buddy. It's like, you're not there to be a buddy. Right. And there's, there's nobody that I, that I would look to and say, oh, I'm inspired by that because by that guy, cause he's my buddy. Yeah. <laughs> now, do I happen to be friends with some of these individuals? Of course. There's people I'm inspired by and motivated by that I'm friends with, but, but buddies doesn't define the relationship. The fact that this is somebody who can speak truth to me, who can tell me hard things, who can call me out, who cares about me, but still is mentally tough enough to have difficult conversations. Those are the things I admire. And if those are the things that we admire and respect, then it's safe to say that maybe we ought to be that to other individuals. In fact, I think as men, we have a moral obligation to be that for our children and also for those who don't have this guidance and direction. That's a big part of what we're doing here. It's a big part of legacy. That's a big part of the reason that I coach youth sports because I have a moral obligation. Whether there's a father in these kids' picture or not, I have a moral obligation to quote unquote father these children. One of the interesting questions I got, uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, was talking about uh, this gentleman um, had a, uh, a soon-to-be son-in-law, and he was asking, like the son-in-law was kind of off track, and he wasn't really excited about him marrying his daughter, and he was like, how should I treat this? I'm like, that's your son, dude. <laughs> that's your son. Whether you like him or not. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. She yeah. likes him. That's now your son. So yeah. you need to be a father to him. And teach him and guide him and instruct him and coach him to the degree that you can. He might really appreciate that and respect that. And not only is it going to serve him, it's going to serve your daughter, which is who you care about as well. So father, we need to be better job at fathering, not only in the walls of our home, but community as well. Yeah, I like it. All right, Alan Placer, for both of you, what made you decide to jump past your fear into your current successes would you say you were a sovereign man before you made the leap or after? What may, read that first part of that question again. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what made you decide to jump past your fear into your current success? Would you say you were a sovereign man before you made the leap or after? I mean, I don't think there's this, any, this big barrier of fear that I, I had became to sovereign. Overcome. Right. Yeah. I, I just don't think there was this thing where I'm like, oh, I'm so afraid and like, how do I do this? And one day I just jumped into the unknown and uncertainty. I don't, I don't think it was like that. I think I had aspirations and things I wanted to do and things I wanted to accomplish. And sure, there was some probably fear that kept me from doing that, but I'm not sure how aware of that fear I was. It was more just, hey, I want to do this. And if I want to do this, I'm just going to take one small step. I think we actually talked about this on the podcast last week. It wasn't a leap. It was just a step, right? One little step, one little step, one little step. And then before you know it, you turn around and realize, man, you've taken a lot of steps and you've covered a lot of distance in that time frame. But it wasn't this big, huge leap into the unknown to face the demons that were my fears. And nah, it wasn't like that. It just wasn't yeah. as grand as that. It's not as sexy as that. Yeah. Um, as far as being sovereign, I definitely have more sovereignty in my life through the process of taking action. So I used to be, I would say, significantly more passive in my life where I kind of let just things happen and the environment was what it was. And I was at the mercy of my wife and my boss and the economy and just about every outside factor. The more that I've learned to make assertive choices and decisions, the more sovereignty that I've captured and reclaimed for myself. So to answer the question, I, I'm more sovereign now after the fact than I was before. It, it's, it's a, it's a active process. It's not a decision. A yeah. decision's not enough. The, it has to have action behind it. Yeah. And I don't know about you, Ryan, but I feel like I'm, I'm constantly seeking sovereignty, right? Like it, it, 
you know, I fall into being bulldozed or being passive and it's, it's, it's almost like integrity, right? It's like you're constantly fighting to have integrity. You need to restore your integrity. You then have integrity and it's like a never ending process. And so I, I think for me, sovereignty, the natural tendencies of, of being a human are in conflict with being sovereign. And, and so I'm constantly battling on maintaining that. So I, I don't know if it's, I wouldn't even feel comfortable saying I am sovereign. I seek to be, I'm on that path, but I struggle and I have to push back and I have to constantly fight for it. Would you, would you, uh, is that the same for you? Yeah, I agree with that. I think sovereignty is something that needs to be earned. I think it's, like I said earlier, it's a very active process. Um, and I'm constantly a little bit to your point, but a little bit differently weighing my actions against the idea of sovereignty. So for example, I don't like drink measuring. alcohol. Right. Yeah. Right. Like I don't drink alcohol. Now some guys will say, well, alcohol is not bad. Well, I don't care what you think. It doesn't move me towards my sovereignty. In fact, it hinders and limits my sovereignty because it affects and alters my mind. And it, it messes with me in a way that, that takes away my power and authority over myself. Like, isn't that kind of the point of drinking? To like, yeah, totally. <laughs> right. <laughs> So yeah, I to choose let go control. Yeah. Right. Same thing with certain foods. Now, look, I'm not telling you I'm, I've got all this stuff figured out, but if I consume a bunch of food and junk food and garbage and I put it in my body, it limits my sovereignty because I'm going to carry around extra weight. And then I don't have as much energy. Maybe I'm not as strong because I'm not working out. And so if something happens and I'm in a dangerous situation, then like, I can't act and I've limited my sovereignty because I've chosen to partake in foods and activities that hinder me, not help me. So I'm, I'm very, very aware of what's going to help me be more free to the point where I, I drive my own car, wherever I go, I drive. Like I don't go with other people Yeah. because if I go with other people, it, and, and I'm not saying other people have like ill intentions or whatever, but if I go with somebody else, my sovereignty is hindered. If we're going somewhere, I will drive. If you want to drive too, then we can drive separate cars. But I want the option of being able to leave or go somewhere else or do something else because I want to. I want to maintain that control over my life to the point where, again, vehicles, things like that. Mm. It's good. It's, it's interesting. And I know this isn't – I mean Alan – assume that it was sovereignty, right? That was like kind of a cause of a leap. And, and I know this is a little bit different, but um, for me though, I, there seemed to be a major shift in my life when I took ownership though. When there was a moment in life where I realized my life's, the current state of affairs in my life where I was at the moment, the hardships in my marriage, the where I was employment, all these other things was 100% my responsibility and result of my own actions. When I, and that was a kind of a defining moment or a time for me. And so it does feel like a leap where there's like a switch hit and I went, holy crap, it was almost like a bad joke. And I thought, I'm responsible for this. No one else is to blame. And that was a major changing point. It wasn't sovereignty per se. I guess it's kind of a form of sovereignty, but it was really just me coming to the realization that my life was in the current state it was because of my own actions. I like that. And I, and I actually agree with that and have had a similar experience in my life. And it wasn't sovereignty because I wasn't aware of the concept of sovereignty. <laughs> yeah, it was like, yeah. It was when my wife and I, we went through our separation and I remember thinking to myself, man, this marriage is over. Like it's over. That was the first time I thought that our marriage was over. I thought we were just separated. And at that point, like this is over and simultaneously thinking, okay, well, I'm just going to be the best catch for the next woman to come into my life. And that's where I started working on myself and taking ownership and looking at where I failed in the marriage up to that point. Fast forward, you know, it's worked out. But um, yeah, that was a defining moment for me. And I started to recapture and reclaim some of the sovereignty that I'd let slip through my fingers by blaming it on my wife, by blaming it on the economy, blaming my, my business on the firm I was working with, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I think it's safe to say there is no sovereignty where you are a victim period. Right. 
or where there's no responsibility, whether it's because you don't have responsibility or because you voluntarily gave it away. You can't have yeah. sovereignty and not also have responsibility. Like yeah. they're, they're married, they're coupled. Responsibility is goes hand in hand with sovereignty. So if you get rid of responsibility, for example, in the, in the trivial little example I just gave you of letting somebody else drive, then you are by default because you gave somebody else responsibility, limiting some of your sovereignty. Now, in some cases, it's okay. Like, it's okay, yeah. right? In other cases, it's not. And you just need to be aware of which ones, which ones you need to maintain that responsibility. Okay. Bobby uh, Jovan, Jovanovic. I did it, Bobby. You did. Ryan, that was good. I've caught some of your recent posts on Instagram in regards to faith and religion. That's at Ryan Mickler, by the way, on Instagram or Twitter. Have uh, How have the two helped you grow as a man and as a father? What, what were the two? Faith and religion? <laughs> faith and religion, yeah. Faith and religion. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so hmm, I'm trying to think about specific ways that it's helped me grow. I mean, really just understanding that there's an eternal perspective on life, that what I do here in this moment is really about more than just this moment. It goes on for eternity, which helps me play at a bigger scale, right? There, because there's responsibility, there's accountability, there's consequences, not just in this life, but eternal consequences, both good and bad for the things that we do. That's been very valuable for me. Uh, and then also knowing that, you know, there's a plan, right? There's, there's a plan. There's a, a way to behave. There's a way to think. There's a way to act. And it will serve you well. And when you live that code, the right things start happening. And by the way, that's not necessarily even a, an exclusively spiritual thought. It can be a very secular thought as well. When you do these behaviors, these are the re results that come from it, right? Yeah. I don't know if you can see this, but I was going to turn my screen around. Can you see this window right here? Oh, that's the door. Hold on. That's the door. <laughs> oh, there's your pretty wallpaper. Hey, we're almost there. I got 75% <laughs> of the way done. Can you see out this window right here? It's just all white. Uh, it's just white? Yeah. I have so much snow falling off the roof right now. It's like just oh, coming off the roof. Sliding off. Sliding yeah, off the roof. I saw that on your Instagram. I'm yeah. assuming that's dangerous when the sheets of ice come flying down because they look sharp and thin, but they, they were thin. Those ones, one of them hit me in my shoulder and it didn't, but yeah, like if it's a big Fine. thick sheet of ice, yeah, probably pretty dangerous. Wouldn't want to get yeah. caught on that. One of them was pretty thick, but it hit your beard and just melted. Just and shattered. Smooth. My yeah. beard just absorbed it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So faith. Yeah. So faith. Um, yeah, just having the code of conduct, the standard by which I live my life. That way I know, okay, these, these beliefs and actions will produce these results. And if I want these results, then all I have to do is behave this way. That's very nice. Um, I just think that, man, you just, we have a, we have a, we have an operating manual for living a good life and being a good human being. So that's always been enough for me. Like when I, when I, when I was baptized, people would ask me like, oh, why'd you get baptized? I'm like, man, I just looked at everything that the church stood for. I looked at everything or the people that I knew who were members of the, the church and it's all good. All of it. It's all good. And that was always enough for me. There wasn't some magical scripture or some special spiritual experience that I had. It was like, these people are good. I want to be a good person. Therefore, I want to do what these people do. And yeah, that's the evidence was good enough. Yeah. I think, and I, I'm assuming you agree, Ryan, a great resource around this subject is, is Pressfield's book of manly men in regards to religion and becoming a better man. And, and one of the things that he mentioned in that book that I thought was really profound and I loved it. And I wish I could remember the exact scripture that he was referencing, but, but he, but he shared a story within the Bible that talks about because a man was aware of his honor, his honor he made X and X decision and Pressfield broke down the translation of Mansfield. That. I just want to clarify Mansfield. 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 What did I, what did I yep. say? Pressfield? Pressfield. Mm -hmm. Oops. Sorry. No, it's okay. I just uh, want to make sure. No, that's good. So the guys um, are going to look for that book. <laughs> Mansfield. Who the hell is this guy? Yeah. So, so anyhow, um, he talked about because he was aware of his, his honor and he made these decisions and he broke that down 
and he and he talked about the translation of that word and it meant that he was aware of his divine nature hmm. and and i thought that was so profound so the the power of saying that you are from a creator and in some cases a, a father in heaven per se or a descendant of god if you want to use that term is divine Right. That is a very powerful way of thinking. And, and, and by default, your potential is what? Is also divine. Divine. Unlimited. Yeah. yeah. So, so now what's our job? Live into it. Take, a, take advantage of, of what's been presented to you, right? And that's possible for everyone. And so I love that, that concept because it really inspires me. And I think it might help a lot of people realize that that who how they become or who they become in life could can be divine that is in in that is possible for all of us if we're willing to put in the work i like that i just i also think it just gives you a perspective on things like if you think about it in the eternal context the things that you get wrapped up in right now might might not be so important as you once thought they were which is a good thing because 90% of the things that we get wrapped up in don't matter at all. Yeah. And if you have that eternal perspective, that may give you a new framework and, and idea of, of what is actually relevant and what is not relevant. And then focus on the 5 to 10% of the things that actually are relevant. Yeah, totally. Dylan Beck, how do you see people who aren't religious at all? I understand that religious beliefs and believing in a higher power, many of my friends are very religious, but I can't bring myself to commit to it. I want to be my own leader. Well, so is he asking what I think about that or how what do I you think see about people, him? Yeah, how do you see people that aren't religious? He didn't ask this question, but I, I'm assuming you want to respond to the idea that by being part of a religion that it limits you from being your own leader because oh, yeah, we'll definitely that address that. Yeah. yeah, we'll definitely address yeah. that. Um, yeah, I know plenty of people who, who wouldn't consider themselves religious and I think they're wonderful people. Um, religion to me is above and beyond the spirituality. Let's just talk about this for a second above and beyond the divine nature the spirituality that we're talking about. Religion is a code of conduct. That's all it is. It's a set of principles that you use that you voluntarily decide to assume and, and live in accordance with that you believe will help you live a more fulfilling, rewarding, profitable life. Can non-religious people have a code of conduct? Yeah. In fact, most of them do. Sure. All of them do. I made yeah. a post on Instagram even because people like to say, oh, you're, you know, just religion is just indoctrinating you. Dude, we're all indoctrinated. Like you, you, you're telling me that you have a problem with organized religion, yet you will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on quote unquote education in the school system for something that you may never use. You have no problem sending your sk your kids to school to, to government schooling for six to eight hours a day. You, you sit here all day on your phone and you worship people you don't even know on social media. And you're telling me you're not indoctrinated somehow. You can, you're consumed and inundated with information from media and entertainment sources and everywhere else that this information comes from. And you don't think you're indoctrinated? We're all indoctrinated. It's just a matter of the doctrine you decide to follow, yeah. whether that's deliberately or, or unintentionally. Every one of us is indoctrinated into something, and we all worship something. So I would just say be a little bit more intentional about it. For me— Religion is something that happens to keep me in line and keeps me on the track that I choose to I choose to go, which leads into the point of what he's talking about with I choose to be my own leader. Just because you follow a code of conduct does not mean that you aren't your own leader. You still have to follow that code. You've voluntarily decided to follow it. You still have to make your choices individually each and every day. You still have your agent agency, which is synonymous with sovereignty. You still have all of that. So religion doesn't, doesn't absolve you of res the responsibility of leading yourself and other people. It just teaches you how to do it more effectively. That's all it is. So I, look, if somebody's not religious, that's cool. Like I hope that they've found something that works for them and, and they lead a good life and they're effective and they're doing all the things they want to do and that their wildest dream, dreams come true. Just like I would hope 
that for a religious person. Like, I, I don't feel, I don't feel like that person's bad or not moral. That's one I hear a lot. People say, well, they're, where's like, they don't have any moral, moral principles. Well, sure they do. Yeah. They're just based upon probably societies or their own version or something else or gods, because whether yeah. you want to acknowledge or not, like that's where morality comes from. <laughs> yeah. So you don't have to acknowledge it for it to be a, a moral code. Like it just is right. So mm -hmm. whatever. Roger Taylor, the order of man Facebook group is a great resource. That said, one of the many benefits of the Iron Council over and above the Facebook group is the opportunity to have more in-depth conversations about the topics covered in the podcast. What else would you describe the differences between the Facebook group and the Iron Council discussions to the men who haven't yet upgraded to the IC? <laughs> uh, I would say focus and framework. So we have a lot more focused discussions as opposed to let's just talk about anything and everything. No, let's Random. focus on this. Yeah. and do a deep dive into what we're doing here. So focus. Secondary, framework. In the Facebook group, not that there's anything wrong with it, but there's no framework. It's like, you post about that, and I comment on this, and you post about that, and then I comment on this, and you get these many comments, and that person gets that many comments, and just kind of a free-for-all within reason, within some parameters. Inside of the Iron Council, there's a framework. So there's assignments, there's the challenges that we do. There's the battle team. So guys are working together. This month we're talking all about competition and we're tracking that and we're keeping score and we're holding each other accountable and there's camaraderie. And there's a lot more framework built around it. So I would say those are the two biggest differentiating factors, focus and framework. Yeah. And, and I think in the IC, because you're part of a team and that group is smaller, obviously substantially smaller than the Facebook group, it becomes intimate, right? You, you're sure. you're having conversations with guys that you have kind of gained respect of. You appreciate their opinion versus putting it into a group of 60,000 guys on Facebook and hoping that the right guy saw your post and gives you a great comp comment that might be beneficial, right? Like right. in the IC, right. you're not going to put something out there and probably not get an amazing response. The probability of that is, is super low. So, well, and I, I think the caliber of men that are in the iron council, if you were to look at the ratios, we'll say, cause I'm not yeah. saying there isn't high caliber men in the Facebook group. There certainly are. I, I can list some right off hand, but in the iron council, the ratio is, is better within the iron council because these guys have invested in being there. So just the fact that them investing and in being in the iron council is a qualifier for them being serious about their growth and helping other people do the same. Now, again, that's not to say that there aren't high quality members of the Facebook group. There certainly are, but then you have other guys who like their buddy invited them or they just saw it or, you know, there's some people in there and we try to weed these guys out who just want to be dicks and trolls and they just like kind of find themselves in there. So you're going to yeah. get more of that in the Facebook group as opposed to the, to the Iron Council, which is more focused and there's a barrier to entry. Yeah. And our apologies for those guys. It is a little tough to moderate such a large group. So, um, you know, it, it is, and we're best. working on it, you know, yeah. we're working on it. And, and you and I talked about this. In fact, the other day is just getting some more moderators on there, getting a standard operating procedure about the way that that group is moderated. So the right posts are getting approved. The incorrect posts are not getting approved. Comments are, are remaining civil and respectful. Trolls are getting removed, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. All right. Scott Shortmeyer, with, with what seems like a dozen of competing priorities, what process or questions do you ask yourself to determine or discern the stack ranking of actions? What do I want? So what result do I want to produce? And which activity is going to help me produce it the most effectively? Do that one. That's it. Yeah. It's not a complicated process. And there's a lot of in intuition that goes into it as well. But the intuition also is developed over time, right? Through yeah. doing the after action review and going through the process that we go through. So there's just some intuitive thoughts that I have. Like if I'm naming a podcast, for example, intuitively, I know that one name might do better. One title might do better than another title. But the only reason that's intuitive is because I've spent a lot of time doing it and I've titled over 500 podcasts now, right? Yeah. So, but as far as priorities go, 
what do I want to accomplish? This is why vision and objectives are so important. And then what is the thing, the activity, the tactic that's going to produce that result the most effectively, the quickest, the most powerfully, the most effectively. Yeah. If you don't mind me adding to that, I, I would even say that you could use Stephen Covey's four quadrants of priority as another way to, to take the vision, take what Ryan just said, and then add the classification type. And so the four categories that Stephen Covey teaches in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, is urgent and important. So it's a fire and it's important not urgent and important. So these would be long term, like it's really important that this gets done, but it's not urgent at this moment, but it needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Then you have not urgent and not important, which you should probably stay out of that quadrant altogether. Um, and then you have urgent and not important. And, and these are kind of social constructs. That last one is often it's someone walking up to you and, and distracting you it has a social construct of being urgent, but guess what? It's not important. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, I think it's valuable to look at those sometimes because we realize how do you mitigate the urgent and important items is by taking care of the not urgent and important. By playing mm -hmm. the long-term game, we start mitigating those fires that constantly eat up a lot of our time. And so there can be some strategy around kind of classifying them and then planning accordingly. This is the issue that a lot of people have with procrastination, because if you procrastinate on the not urgent, but important, then they become the important and the urgent. And then you don't have the time or mental capacity to do it correctly. Yeah. So plan out the non urgent and important and, and work those over. Don't procrastinate. So it doesn't become something that you're incapable of handling, or if you are capable of handling, do so to an inferior degree. Make yeah. sure you cover that not urgent but important quadrant. Yeah, and and if you don't mind me, I, I love this thought process, and I it was a few years ago that I realized this, is sometimes we cheat ourselves from learning. So let me give you an example. I push something off, I procrastinate, and now it becomes urgent and important, and I have an option. I can stay up all night long and do it perfectly, or I can not do it well, have an inferior product and get some sleep. Sometimes when we do that inferior product and we get some sleep, we didn't learn the lesson, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you honor your word, right? And I always do what I said I would do. Eventually I'm going to learn what to say no, because <laughs> right. I'm going to, because you I'm don't want to do that again, a lot of sleep and everything else. But if I don't honor my word, guess what? I don't learn that lesson. Mm -hmm. I don't learn the lesson when I'm out of integrity, but if I'm at least in integrity, I learn the lesson of establishing boundaries, saying no sometimes, you know, being, don't procrastinate. But when, when it works and we kind of skim and we provide a, a poor quality product, we, we lose the opportunity to learn and grow. Well, not only that, you actually encourage yourself to procrastinate in the future. Yeah. Cause it worked. It worked out. Okay. It worked. Yeah. You're like, Oh, I, you, I could have worried about that for two months, but instead I worried about for two days, like, and it actually worked. Well, pff, I'm going to do that next time too. This yeah. is also the reason that you have to have your kids experience consequences because <laughs> if, you, if you don't give them consequences to their thing, then they're going to keep doing the dumb mistake. And yeah, it's going to be easier for you in the short term because you don't have to discipline your children and nobody likes doing that. But over the long term it's going to be a nightmare when that kid turns 16 and has a little bit of control over his own life. And then not to mention they're going to get slaughtered in the real world because they never associated action with consequence. Yeah. And the stakes just get higher and higher as they get Completely. older. <laughs> Completely. Yeah. Yeah. Unwanted pregnancy, loss of a job, bankruptcies. I mean, there's all medical issues. There's all kinds of things that, that arise because of this. Yeah. All right. We have two more questions than I see. You good with those? Yeah. Let's get those cranked out. All right, Josh Hubler, finding people with the same drive and ambition has been difficult in normal day-to-day -day life. How easy was it for you guys to find like-minded men with the same ambition in the area that you live in? It's not easy. I moved to Maine to make it happen. Like it's not an easy thing. You know, somebody asked me about the other day on Instagram if if I moved to Maine to be closer to the guys with origin. I'd be lying if I said that wasn't a factor. You right. know, I identified. Uh, 
Pete and Brian as people that I, I appreciated, that I admired, that I respected. And that was a consideration in us being here. And it's, it's, it's been a good move because of that. So it's not, it's certainly not easy to find people who are like-minded. That's why the Iron Council continues to do so well. If it was easy to find like-minded individuals, there would be no need for the Iron Council. Yeah. So we created an environment. We planted our flag and said, hey, guys, this is where we're meeting. If you are somebody who's inspired, motivated, wants to improve and get better, then come meet us over here. So I would say because you're in the Iron Council, use the Iron Council, <clears throat> but also find your regional channel and chapter within the Iron Council. So you can find guys in your area who subscribe to the Iron Council way and that are in your area and you can meet face to face. Outside of that, figure out where these guys would go. Where would they go? Well, they'd go to the gym. They would go to business networking meetings because they're worried about growing their businesses. Uh, maybe church because they're worried about living a, 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 to a code, some sort of morality code. That's where these guys are going to go. So that's where you, if you want to find them, you have to go where they are. So start identifying where these individuals are. They're not in the bar. They're not getting drunk on Friday night, right? That they're, they're doing their thing. They're doing productive things. Go to those activities, go to meetup.com, find something that you're interested in. Maybe it's hiking or photography or whatever, and go, go to those events. You're going to find people who are interested in the same things you are. And obviously they had to search and meet up and, and show a little initiative. So that's a good sign. And just put yeah. yourself around those individuals. Yeah. And for you guys that travel, I've really enjoyed the few times where I've jumped in the IC, looked up a regional channel and said, Hey, I'm going to be in the area. And then a group of guys get together and we grab dinner. Like that is so cool. Yeah. So if you're one of those guys that travels a lot for work, like use the IC as a, as a way to connect with guys, you know, wherever you're traveling because mm -hmm. they're everywhere. Everywhere, man. We are taking over the world. Over the world. All right. Paul Karaman, the third. How can we create more robust discussions around vision and calibration as there seems to be a lot of focus and attention to condition, which is admittedly easier to quantify? Yeah, completely. Condition quadrant is easy. Condition, for those of you who may not know, is your physical health. So lose body fat, lose weight on the scale, deadlift a certain amount. That That's easy, right? Uh, he said calibration, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So calibration is infinitely more difficult because it's getting right with yourself. It's, it's mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. That's what calibration is. So how to have more robust conversations about it? That's the answer. Have conversations about it. Bring it up in your channels. Bring it up in your teams. Ask guys what they're doing. Um, when you are sharing or, or having some success in that quadrant, the calibration quadrant, Share it with other individuals. Let them know what's working. Let them know what isn't working. Lead, like take take this mantle upon yourself to have these types of discussions that maybe aren't being had or had to the degree that you would like or the way in which you would like it. You have a lot of opportunities here to really take on this, this opportunity to serve yourself and serve other people by having these conversations. But I do agree that, yes, it's the it's hardest tougher. one. It's, yeah. it's the hardest one taking care of yourself. You know why it's hard to is because we have been conditioned talking about indoctrination from earlier to believe that as men, we shouldn't serve ourselves. Right. And any time that you serve yourself, what are you labeled as toxic? Right. If you go out and you do something for yourself, like you go to the gym and you work out and get strong, or you go on a hunt, you leave your family and you go on a hunt to do something that's going to engage and uplift and edify you, then, oh, you're engaging in toxic behavior. So is it any wonder that we don't know how to take care of ourselves? And then what ends up happening is as we serve other individuals at the expense of ourselves, we drain, right? And we lose power and we lose energy and we lose effectiveness. And then we can't serve those people as effectively as we'd like. And then we get labeled as toxic. Yeah, because we're bitter and resentful and upset and angry and and because we didn't do the things to take care of ourselves. Yeah. So from from a young age, we're conditioned, you know, share, make sure everybody else is happy. You need to provide. And all of those things are true to to a degree, but it should never come at the expense of your own well-being. 
you need to learn to take care of yourself, your calibration quadrant, so that you can more effectively serve yourself and also serve other people. Yeah. And how unfair is it to give your sovereignty over to someone else and say, hey, by the way, my happiness and, and how I feel today and, and if I have a great day or not is dependent on you. <laughs> Good point. Like, is that beneficial to your spouse to put that on them? Like it's, they, well, you've mentioned this numerous times. It's flattering maybe at first, and then it's just overbearing. Think about how exhausting that would Ugh. be. You're responsible for your own happiness and then everybody else's happiness as well. Yeah. That's exhausting. It is. So don't you don't want that put upon you. Don't put it on other people. You worry about yourself so that other people can worry about themselves and then you have the capacity to serve them in a meaningful way. Yeah, totally. You know, we it through the questions we obviously addressed, you know, the two different ways that you guys can connect with us on the AMA. One is through our Facebook group. That's facebook.com slash group slash order of man. And then, of course, our exclusive brotherhood, the Iron Council. You can learn more at orderofman.com slash Iron Council. We do June 11th through the 14th. We mentioned this before, but just as a reminder, as this fills up, June 11th through the 14th, 2020, is our legacy event. That's a father and son event, um, which is kind of established a rites of passage and, and a great experience for fathers to bond with their sons, to get dirty, to go through some grit, perseverance, establish a code of conduct. Like it's, it's just a really highly impactful event that's in Maine. Um, and you can learn more about legacy at orderofman.com slash legacy. And of course, for swag related to order of man, visit our store at store.orderofman.com wallets, shirts, hats. There's a lot of stuff that's gone um, because of the holidays. So stay tuned. I'm assuming a lot of that will be restocked and, uh, we'll be able to get our battle planners, wallets, flags, t-shirts, hats, and more shortly. I'm assuming. But yes. I'm in the next, mind. in the next week or two, Kip, <laughs> okay. I was just admiring you, man. You're getting really good at, uh, closing us out. That was, that was actually really impressive, especially after pitch. last week. We, but we butchered <laughs> <laughs> we butchered last, it was either last week or the week before. I'm like, holy cow, that was ugly. But, uh, we're tightening things up. We're, yeah. we're finally starting to figure this thing out a little bit. Lessons learned. You, you do a, a shitty job one day and do a great job the next day. Everyone would be like praising you. Oh man, you know, you're doing so much better. It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. But now we have this high bar that we need to continue yeah, yeah. to like reach. <laughs> no more sandbagging around here. Yeah. All right, guys, I hope that uh, those answers served you well, that you learn and grow from those things. Um, yeah, join with us. Band with us on Facebook and the Iron Council. This month is all about competition in the Iron Council. Uh, we're really growing, and I think part of that is because it's the new year. Guys are focused on a new version of themselves and getting some frameworks to do that, and the Iron Council might be a great resource for that for you. Uh, all right, we'll be back on Friday. Yes, Friday for your Friday field. Until then, go out there, take action, become the man you are meant to be.